Okay, welcome back to our Anunnaki series. I'm coming to you now on Tuesday, the 23rd of uh, July. This is now chapter 7 that I'll be talking about from Moro Bellino's book, the book that will forever change our ideas about the Bible. <clears throat> this chapter is basically, it's pretty easy to summarize but quite profound in its implications. So it's about the motif of blessing and curse in the Old Testament. Uh, what he wants to show here is very similar to the point he made in the last video I covered in the previous chapter concerning the law being not given with the intention of starting a religion or creating some um, ethical system that would bring benefit to mankind. It had the very practical, um, the very practical goal of kind of keeping, keeping the people of Israel manageable, right? Just keeping them, um, you know, mel melding them into a, a national unity, um, because the, the practical benefit for, for Yahweh, who, as we saw, is not an angel in some ethereal sense, or a god in some ethereal sense, but rather a flesh and blood being as much as we are, with the exception that they were you know, that the Elohim, the Anunnaki were of greater physical stature, taller, um, lived much longer, appeared by comparison with us to be immortal. Aside from that, they were very much like us. And so the need to bring a national cohesion to the people of Israel was important for Yahweh because they were his, <clears throat> they were his, um, inheritance, according to Deuteronomy 32, which we will get to at some point in this series. And <clears throat> the issue of blessings and curses um, is very similar in the sense that, as he points out in the chapter, uh, ancient you know, ancient the ancient Semitic language does not um, does not render the connotation of the Hebrew word for blessing, baraka, if I'm pronouncing that correctly, baraka, baraka. Um, it is not rendered. <clears throat> as something um, intangible. It's not, it has nothing to do really with the soul or spirit of a man or the afterlife or any such thing. On the contrary, it has everything to do with concrete, material, objective, verifiable um, you know, you know, things like you know, water sources, wells, land, territory, um, money, cattle, sheep, all that, that, that sort of thing. And the same goes for curses as well, as he points out. So the word baraka in Hebrew undergoes a similar transformation in Christian theology that the term kavod underwent. You might remember from our episode on the kavod how he discusses the fact that although it became kind of an abstract term in Christian theology to indicate the glory of God, in reality it's much closer to 
uh, being a sort of solid, hard, metallic, shiny, you know, object, heavy object. So he's saying we say we see the same thing here with Barakah, with the, with the concept of blessing. And it's it's helpful. I'll, I won't go through because I don't want it. It'll get too dry if I try to um, recount every example he gives here. But I want to give a few examples so you can kind of see what he's talking about. <clears throat> There's the obvious one here in Genesis one twenty two. Uh, after the creation of fish and birds, the Elohim blesses the animals to be fruitful and to multiply and to replenish the land. So again, a very objective material blessing. <clears throat> um, again, in Genesis 26, 3 through 4, Isaac decides to leave the country, which has been hit by famine. His plan is to go down to Egypt to seek for food for himself and his people. Yahweh tells him to go camp in the region <clears throat> that he himself will show him and promises, I will bless you because I will give you and your offspring all this land. You see the same thing in Deuteronomy 28, verse 2 and following. Again, it's all about material prosperity. Blessed is the fruit of thy womb, the fruit of thy land shall be blessed in your barns and in any undertaking of your lands. God will make you abound in goods as children. Abundant will be the breeding of your herds and the young of the flock and so on. <clears throat> Again, you see it with Jacob, the blessing of Joseph, Joseph's sons, Ephraim and Manasseh. <clears throat> in this case, the laying on of the right hand conferred those rights which depended upon, which depended, on which depended, I'm sorry, a person's entire life. So properties, herds, lands, slaves, wealth, and power. <clears throat> Again, you see the same thing in Judges 1, 11 through 15, which describes certain phases of the conquest of the prom promised land. <clears throat> so you have um, <clears throat> in Judges 1 there 11 through 15 it tells a story that helps kind of shed light on the concept of blessing the way we are the way it's it, you know we're saying it should be intended uh, Caleb the son of Yefune of the tribe of Judah is preparing to attack the city of Kiryat Safir and promises his daughter Aksa to the one who will conquer the city in Judges 1.12. The expedition is won by Othniel, son of Caleb's younger brother, who then gets the promised gift. The couple receives as a dowry a territory in the Negev, a well-known desert area that would have been difficult to work and to make productive. So you just see this in example after example. Uh, again, you see it with the story of Jacob and Esau. <clears throat> and although this is a bit of a um, divergence from the topic at hand, he includes this in the chapter, and I think it's um, important enough to discuss because this is actually, this motif is discussed in a number of studies that I've read on the subject of the Elohim, <clears throat> and it concerns the red hair of Esau. So let me go ahead and read that. It's sort of an aside in the chapter, but I think it's important to consider. So, uh, and, and honestly, I think we've we've illustrated the point I wanted to make well enough about blessing blessings and curses, and what that entailed in ancient Israel, what it entailed for the Hebrews, for the patriarchs. <clears throat> so let me just read this on the red hair. It is interesting to note that the Bible has felt the need to point out that Esau was red like a hairy mantle. 
This characteristic reddish or fulvous hair returns in the Old Testament, think of King David, and is remarked as a non-ordinary fact. We cannot help recalling what was said in the chapter on the Anakims about the Anunnaki's creation being identified with the name of black heads, as if to highlight a difference with another type of hair color. It is certainly strange to think that this phenotype characterized by red hair could be interpreted as the kind of reappearance of characteristics pertaining to the dominant species, the creator's race. Obviously, we have no certain evidence, but the identification of hair color was definitely of significant importance. It is worth repeating here a curiosity about these differences. The apocryphal book of Enoch says that the wife of Lamech, Enoch's grandson, gave birth to a child whose appearance, however, was a source of doubt for the father. The skin of the newborn did not have the same color as that of the local natives. It was white and pink. His hair was white, and his very beautiful eyes seemed to emanate light. Then Lamech said to his father Methuselah that his wife had given birth to a son who did not look like humans' children, rather the children of, quote, angels. That is to say that Lamech suspected that his son had been generated by one of the, quote-unquote, guardians, or the Elohim. Methuselah asked for clarification from Enoch, who reassured him, guaranteeing that the child was Lamech's and had to be named Noah. This particular difference then returns in several parts of the period's literature. I'll make a little um, side note to that as kind of a parenthetical. I have read in esoteric literature that there was, um, just as a point of interest, I can't prove this, but I, I just have an inkling that it's probably true, um, that there were originally five races on this planet um, that were all uh, of symbolic significance in alchemy. So you have the red and the yellow people, the black and the white, and then you have the blue people, and supposedly the blue people, uh, the blue race, at some point in the distant past, <clears throat> either disappeared. Whether they were destroyed, died off, were killed off, or just went underground, went into hiding, we don't know. But esoterics claim this as a point of common knowledge and not really something debatable. Just FYI. And that pretty much summarizes the, um, the gist of this chapter, and we will come back to discuss chapter 8. <clears throat> um, well, no, let me, there's one other thing I think I should talk about here with respect to blessing, and that has to do with, with Adam. The very first blessing that the Elohim has given to the man was life, and second was the ability to sexually reproduce in order to populate the earth. So again, at the very, very beginning, this has nothing to do with uh, anything spiritual having to do with the spirit, the soul, or the afterlife. Um, both blessing and cursing in the Bible is intrinsically tangible. <clears throat> um, and I think it's significance that sexuality is tied to the original concept of blessing. Um, but that's probably for another time. Um, there's some other material on that that I'm not getting into now, perhaps in the future. But the next chapter, chapter 8, is going to discuss alien machines in the prophets. Um, so until then, uh, hope you enjoy this video, and until then, have a great week.